Boa tarde. Ok. Boa tarde. Sinto muito, eu não falo português. Then I will give this presentation in English. It's a presentation that is a little bit more. Okay. But so good afternoon. I'm going to give this presentation in English. I'm sorry about that. And um, it's a presentation that is a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure if it's really aligned with the theme and the communities here because it's a presentation about business. And that's why for the last couple of days I've been wearing a tie because it is about business, not about just coding. And I'm not going to, um, to pretend I will talk about developing software. No, I'm just showing you that I'm going to, told you to, tell, to tell about how to make business, not how to make business with software, but what it takes to make business with software. And the situation we are here today is the result of a long history. So I will, I will cover two thirds of my presentations, maybe on the history and the mechanisms that explains how the software industry is working today from the perspective of the open source software. And then in the end, we will get to the lessons very naturally. So let's get started with what I have here, free software and open source models. My, my perspective here comes from the growth of open source software. We all use our different figures, and we have figures from Europe here about the growth of open source software. This is the quantitative view. But in my uh, understanding, this quantitative view hides a more qualitative view, and I have the perception, and that I would like to share with you, that there's been three layers of open source producers. The first layer started 30 years ago, when Richard Stallman sent that email, that email that said, I'm going to create a new Unix software. And that was an answer to the reproprietarization of Unix by AT&T. He went on to create or to establish, to define the four freedoms that uh, really set the stage to where we are today. So the first one is to use the software for any purpose. The second is the freedom to read the software. The third one is the freedom to share the software, to distribute it. And the fourth one is the freedom to improve it and to, modify, and to distribute and to share modified version of this software. These four simple rules have had the power to change the software industry. Of course, they define how you as developers, you behave with software, but they also had an impact on the way the whole software industry works. Then, a few years later, 10 years later, Linus Torvald sent that mail saying he would develop another operating system. And then the rest is history. That layer gave us the most beautiful open source projects, the most natural grassroots project that did set the example for us all here. We would not be here today without these guys. That also gave us some institutions. And, um, that's the layer I call the um, open source. It's more free software. That at the time is free software, and that's for developers. And that gave us some institutions, like the open source initiatives, that went on to define or to actually look after the licenses uh, for open source, free and open source software. Because we are here in a, in a context of sharing and playing together, so we need to have the rules. And this, uh, the open source uh, initiative and the licenses define the rules. That's the first layer. It worked because it uh, was based on, it de demonstrated technical efficiency. By sharing development, by sharing these efforts, we could collectively debug software, and we could collectively deliver very high quality software. 
So that's the synthesis of the first layer. Some institutions came with this layer. I mentioned the open source initiatives, but we also had the, um, the Free Software Foundation and the Apache Foundation. They come from that layer. But then, in the middle of the 90s, something happened. For some reason, free software found its way really into business and became commercial open source. To the point that, if I look at the enterprise, at enterprise software, which really was three quarters of the software industry in terms of revenue, each product category that were defined by proprietary, by proprietary vendors were challenged by open source vendors to the extent that some proprietary vendors literally disappeared. Think of business object in business intelligence. Think of a vignette in uh, document management, etc. That gave us a bonanza of startups and small um, open source companies, pure play open source companies that did play more or less uh, openly with the open source business model, I agree, but that did create an opportunity for them and they all today take, took us to, what, to where we are today. Of course, there's been some skepticism. Many people, and I'm sure you've had this, uh, uh, this question, but how do you make money with free software? Well, there is a reason because free software or open source software has a business model. There's a real business model that can uh, help companies actually make money. It's based on selling complementary products, it's based on selling additional services, and it's based on selling what I call an insurance, which are the subscription services. And the insurance business model is not a bad business model. So we have an actual business model for open source software, and that's the reason why we're still here today. To the point that some companies that the big companies you see there that you would not identify with open source software or free software, well, these people are investing millions of dollars or euros in open source software. They have people working full time on open source software. If you look at the top right um, um, logo there, well, the president of the Apache Foundation is a full time employee of Microsoft. Why? Because these big companies have a strategic vision. They don't tell you, oh, what do I do with free software? No, they know that free software and open source is part of an industry strategy. That's what I call the layer and open source for the entrepreneurs. It worked because, as I said, there is a real business model and it provides business efficiency. Some think of open source like free marketing or um, it works. And that's the synthesis. And we've had institutions built from that period. The Eclipse Foundation is built from that period. Even the Linux Foundation, as we know today, is from that period. OW2, my organization, is from that period. And we are dealing not only with developers, but with companies. And then something happened around 2010. Cloud computing. Actually, it did take many people by surprise. We've been talking about computing on demand, on demand computing, etc., for, for ages, for 20 years. But suddenly, it coalesced and we had cloud computing. But cloud computing brings a different dimension with us. This it's not a prison, as someone asked me if it was a prison. It's not a car factory either. This is the Google data center 50 miles south of Brussels. We've, we're a long way away from developing in the garage. This is becoming a, an affair of big business. And big business, some of these big business are still powered by open source. Look at these names. They are all using open source. These businesses are powered by open source. So, but what do they do with open source? Do they just use it? Like I see so many people do it. No, because they are leaders. They have a strategic vision and they understand that to keep the technology going, they have to share it. 
so some of them are open sourcing their core technologies. That's what uh, Facebook is doing with open compute. That's what uh, Yahoo has done with Hadoop. And they are creating this new layer where they understand that to push the technology and to push technology in the context where everyone is uh, dependent on, on, other, on other companies, where technologies are hybrid, heterogeneous, etc., they have to share it and they have to push the innovation in, in a way that I call ecosystem-based innovation. And they use open source software because it's a good vehicle to cooperate without having complex IP negotiations. And we have many examples. I'd like to, pay, uh, to, bring your, to take your attention on one point here. And it is that each of these ecosystems, I'm going to show you a couple here, are all developing in the framework of an open source organization. Hadoop is within the Apache Foundation. Genevi for in-car uh, infotainment is developing within the Linux Foundation. Open Daylight for software developed network, for software defined network, is developing within the framework of the Linux Foundation as well. Polarsys for embedded, uh, um, embedded software is developing within the framework of the Eclipse Foundation. We have our own uh, at OW2, and of course, the key example of uh, bringing people to work together with a governance is OpenStack, where OpenStack, having a certain critical mass, they could afford to create their own foundation. OW2 with open, with, was with OpenStack when they announced it in July uh, 10. We issued the first press release saying we were supporting it. And then we saw that. We saw the discussion because there were tensions. Many companies working together need so, some governance. They need some rules. They could have joined another, another organization. They were so big, they could afford to create their own organization and their own governance. And that's what I call open source by committees or the ecosystem-based open source where the decisions are made by many people working together. And it works because strategically it is efficient because it enables people to share a common vision of the market and to avoid investing in directions where they will find all their own and lose their investment. So by working together, they are all building the market of tomorrow and making sure that they maximize uh, the, the, uh, their return on investment. And they use open source. That's another that is another dimension here. And I put it this way, where we had the OpenStack, and today, us, uh, many organizations are following, following that trend by helping groups of companies, ecosystems, work, to work together. And by the way, I invite you to stay to the next presentation, which is exactly the, uh, uh, an, an illustration of what I'm, I'm saying here. So those are the three layers, the evolution. But now let's work, see how it works, because this is just a description of what we have. But how did it work? What were the mechanisms that took us there? First of all, remember, I'm talking about the software value chain, but software is code. It's, it's text, basically, generated from a keyboard or from a machine, but some, something you can at some point read. But when you want to do business with software, then this software becomes a product. And the product is what is a product? It's not just the code. A product is something much more complex. It's something that ha comes with everything that a, a user, an average user, expects to see. Documentation, training, roadmap, even some contracts, even some pricing. And everything that's next to the code is probably more important sometimes, and I'm sorry to say that here, but it could be even more important than the code itself. Let's look at a real life example. You, know this you all know this company, 
And you know that the American companies, they have to publish their account, and this is a Form 10K that anyone can download from, uh, from the website. If you look at the, at the revenue of this company, you see that at the bottom line, they do $38 billion in revenue, of which $8.5 billion in new software uh, licenses, etc. If I look at the percentage there, uh, you, look that, you see that there are some hardware, because this company is Oracle, and they, you know, they acquired CERN, and that, uh, that's the, the, business, the CERN's business that is represented here on the hardware lines. But if you look at the percentage, look at the top right of this, um, this graph, you, you do realize that uh, in, if I look at the whole uh, revenue, 38, 000, uh, 38 billion, Software, um, the software is uh, the top five uh, lines. So if I take the top five lines to the right, and you see they represent $29.5 billion, you realize that the licenses, including software product licenses, even Cloud SaaS, I'm taking this kind of subscriptions in there uh, for good measure, even Cloud ES um, uh, subscriptions, they represent just like a third of the whole revenue. Two thirds of the revenue, the software revenue of a company that is a, a real good example of a software vendor come not from software licenses, but from everything that's around. So that takes us back to the value chain. Research and development develop and delivers code, pokes, etc. demonstrators. But then the market wants more. The rest would not exist without the code. It's absolutely fundamental. But it's the rest that gives this code market value. And the rest is what people call marketing, which is done with people wearing ties and suits. And in the case of open source software, users not only expect that, but they also expect predictability they expect to trust the software. The difference between what the research and development delivers and that is what I call the delivery challenge. And we are all confronted to this delivery challenge. So that's one thing about the value chain where we have, we have to think where we are in, when we are developing. But there is more. There is more if I want to look at this layer two and three. I'm going to borrow a model by a, prof, a Harvard professor, Clayton Christensen. Um, that wrote a very interesting book, The Innovator's Dilemma, and this uh, model is the, um, the model of the um, disruptive innovation theory. That's the framework. The vertical axis represents the functionality of the software or of a technical artifact. The horizontal axis represents the time. And the dotted line you see across represents the growing maturity of the users. They grow slow, slowly, because it's not their job to learn how to use technology. So they adopt the technology, and then they become more proficient in using it. Now, what happened with the technology, with the first uh, wave of proprietary vendors? They entered market categories, business intelligence, uh, document management, uh, BPM, etc. you name it. They invented the product category, they invested. They trained the users. And would they compete by lowering the prices? No, they compete by adding functionalities. And that's what the, the line that goes up represents. It represents them adding more and more functionalities until they go beyond what the users are capable of uh, absorbing. And they become irrelevant. But having do that, done that, they pave the way for the second generation. And that second generation were the, software, the open source software vendors. They got into a market that was already defined with existing standards, existing components. They had to put everything together. Some code was existing. They only had to go and grab co customers. That's how the second layer materialized. But how did the third layer materialize? Well, I can use the same thing, same model, and by using the YAS product category in, in cloud computing. We've had the original vendors, proprietary vendors, Amazon, VMware, Microsoft. What happened is the reaction, the second, the followers entered the market much, much faster because they'd learned from 10 years before. 
So the, the next line starts at the same time. And it develops. But what we know is that the open stack, the cloud stack, and the open nebula, all these collaborative projects, we know they don't they deliver something, but they're not there yet because users often complain that it's not totally uh, usable. So who does who closes the gap? Leaders. Leaders that do what? They take these technologies that are developed there and they package them into distributions in a way they productize them. And these are the distributions that people use. The cloud distribution by Red Hat, by HP, etc. And in fact, they have behaviors that are a little bit proprietary. So that's the third wave, and that's where we are today. So now, what about our lessons? I have four simple lessons. The first one, as you've already understood, code is only a fraction of the software value chain. It's the whole value chain that really creates the, 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 the market value for the piece of software. Uh, the users want a full business proposal, and we know that the, the, the average decision maker wants a, a value proposal that they can compare with proprietary vendors. That's something we have to bear in mind. The second is that collaborative efforts, collaborative coding, collaborative innovation, even R&D, does not deliver market-ready offerings. It does create good technology. It just invents technology. But it's a technology that only pro professional software engineers, people like you in this room, can use but not like people out there in town. The average manager does not know how to, to uh, integrate this. And the problem is that, of course, the developer has a natural tendency to spend more time on coding, on elegant coding, than on elegant documentation. Elegant documentation is not something we thrive for. Even testing. So of course, there is some testing that has to be embedded in the way you, you develop, but even that is a little bit something uh, um, that they don't look forward to, to doing. So we know that code is the soul of open source, free software and open source projects, but if we want them to survive and to really take the market share that they deserve, we need to think of them in a more comprehensive way. The third lesson is that successful collaborative project must implement a flawless governance. A governance that uh, is transparent, that people can trust. This is the only way you can attract third party collab uh, collaborators, contributors. It's by being transparent and having a governance that people can trust. You have to Announce what you're going to do and do what you announce and, and make sure that you're open to criticism. Not, and it's not only for the contributors to the, the core code, but since we are in the age of platforms, we want people to complement, to, to develop add-ons, plugins, etc., cetera, to, to, so, to the applications. And then, if you want them to trust you, you need to attract them. Even, even if these people develop proprietary add-ons, proprietary plugins, it's good for your software. At some point, somebody will, will do it in open source way, and, and open source uh, will really prevail. And to implement this flowerless governance, the key is to rely on professional community management. Professional community management that is accountable to its community that publishes results and really is accountable. So it's, there is no room anymore for amateur, because you remember the big companies that work together, they're not, they're not here just for fun. They're here for real business, and real business has to be totally uh, uh, transparent and professional. So that's the role of some of the organizations. And the last one is that, unfortunately, today the successful projects are supported financially by IT companies. 
the time where the Apache web server appeared out of nowhere from a university, from a publicly funded research uh, organization. This is historical. It's history. Can we replicate this today? We don't know. But the big companies, those that are in the software industry, don't want to rely on serendipity. They want to rely on investment and professional management. So they are their own marketing people, designing the roadmaps, being paid for to look after this uh, project and to contribute. Because they can't afford to have some, uh, um, some open source project that could take them by surprise. That's a strategic vision. So I know it's a bit difficult from the standpoint of the, of the uh, individual developer. So let's look a bit further. Having said that, what do we have? Beyond enterprise software, we have to look beyond enterprise software because everything I've mentioned here was in fact uh, uh, determined by this vision from the standpoint of enterprise software. And again, for the simple reason that it is where most of the business is made most of the resources are. But you have to look at IoT. Today, IoT is different. Because in Internet of Things, you have the things. And the things are, are th uh, things that depend on the, on the usage. A BI, a BI platform, business intelligence, you can use it in any sector, transportation, distribution, healthcare, government. But an Internet of Things applications that controls lightning, relies on sensors that are spe specific sensors with specific protocols, etc. So the, the, the usage in IoT is very present, is very there. And that changes a little bit the things. So I don't have the solution, but I'm just observing. The second thing that is changing the root of the games is that because there is this physical investment now in all that, uh, it's think of in physical investment in smart cities or smart transportations, you cannot really go back. I mean, you can probably go back if you have a database and you want to change database and have another uh, database ven vendor, even if it costs you. But to change from a tr smart transportation system to another smart transportation system is something difficult. So there are some dependencies. The, uh, the exit cost is very, is very high. And things will change a little bit. I mean, the, the games will probably change. And in terms of open source software, we will have to be prepared to deal with that. I don't have solutions. I'm just, just observations. Third uh, idea for the future is that what I said already, professional open source organizations. So here, of course, I'm talking for my organization, which is OW2. But I'm also talking for Eclipse a Foundation, the Apache Foundation, the Linux Foundation, the OpenStack Foundation. They need to be professionally driven, but not only with services that manages the administration, like the payroll, the budget, or the brand, uh, but also services that provide a vision to the community. They also need leadership. They don't, they don't need just administrative services. They need leadership. They need community working together to create a, a possible future. Next, and the last uh, idea for the future, is that when you look at the industry, and again, I'm talking from the point of view of the industry, these companies are investing money there. You see some vendors that are everywhere. They are in all the foundations, in all the collaborative projects. You have other vendors that are specialized and very visible and in control of one project, maybe. And then you have the other vendors that may be uh, small vendors, very dedic dedicated to one ecosystem, very visible, bringing very key technology, but without so much market power. And I think that in the next 15 years, we will see recomposition of the industry around these mechanisms. And I think we will have some of the big leaders regaining maybe their big leadership. So the question for us is, if we, we go back to the early 80s and the 30 years we've been through with op soft, open source software, thinking we would change the, change the game in software, we have to bear in mind 
that the incumbent vendors, they're not stupid. They look at us, they invest, and they embrace, they will embrace open source software. So what will be our future in there? I don't know yet, but we will have to create it ourselves. So that's my talk today. To, the result where we are today is a combination of at least three layers, historical layers. So open source and free software is not just one black box brand entity. There are different uh, culture, different in, uh, interests that make what open source is about today. That results from certain mechanisms that we have to understand that are based on innovation, creating new technology, and uh, uh, competing within each other. Um, I've tried to put together four lessons. That code is not, it's the basis, but it's not enough. That uh, ecosystems develop more than, uh, more than, uh, I mean, the, the technology, but they need to develop more, and some, some people are there very opportunistically to grab what is developed and make money out of that. So we need to understand all these mechanisms to regain control of our future. Thank you very much.